Welcome to Brookings. I'm Ted Pacone, a senior fellow with the Foreign Policy Program in the International Order and Strategy Initiative. And welcome to the fourth edition of the Justice Stephen Breyer Lecture on International Law. I also want to welcome our viewers who are watching us via webcasting. We are very happy to co-sponsor this series on international law with the Hague Institute for Global Justice and with the support of the Municipality of The Hague and the Embassy of the Netherlands in Washington. Before introducing our speakers, let me explain why we chose the topic of technology, accountability, and international law. Few of us doubt that the spread of digital technology and the internet has vastly improved our knowledge of the world, our productivity, our ability to communicate instantly with each other, with millions of people around the world. But we now live in a world in which the intersection of these three concepts is fast becoming a chaotic traffic jam rather than an orderly movement of important principles like access to information, justice, and human rights that are matched up to good practices that lead to positive outcomes for society. And as in any bad traffic situation, accidents are bound to happen. Law enforcement's ability to protect the public is thwarted. Individual privacy is violated. Elections are manipulated. And victims wait for justice with no reply. What we need, in my view, is a set of rules, protocols, and standards that will help guide the many actors in this drama, governments, technologists, businesses, civil society, lawyers, and ethicists, toward better outcomes for the general public. These rules are needed at both the national and international levels, and they need to be harmonized in ways that protect our fundamental norms of human rights, rule of law, and justice. Not surprisingly, it was difficult to find just one expert who could integrate all the complexities of this subject into one comprehensive answer. But we did find some of the very best minds who could, in true multi-stakeholder fashion, bring their expertise to the table and help us diagnose the problem and engineer some potential solutions. Just briefly, since you have their bios in your programs, uh, let me introduce them. Our keynote speaker, John Carlin, has unique experience managing these issues as the Justice Department's highest ranking national security lawyer, handling cases involving cross-border terrorism, espionage, and cyber threats. He now chairs the Global Risk and Crisis Management Practice at Morrison and Foster Law Firm in New York. After hearing from John with his keynote remarks, we will then ask Jeroen van der Hoven, a leading global thinker on ethics and technology at Delft University of Technology at The Hague, to lead a discussion with John and our two other panelists. We have Alexa Honig, Koenig, excuse me, Executive Director of the Human Rights Center at the University of California Berkeley School of Law, who will give us a perspective on how technology can be used to advance accountability for grave human rights violations. And Malika Sadasar, Senior Counsel on Civil and Human Rights at Google, and an outspoken advocate for women's and girls' rights throughout her career in law and advocacy. After their discussion, we will have time to take your questions before we break shortly before noon. Let me now ask Saskia Brownness, the newly appointed Deputy Mayor of The Hague, to make some introductory remarks from her perspective as a representative of the City of International Peace and Justice. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Ted, sorry. <laughs> Honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor for me to be here at the Brookings Institute, institution, the most influential thinking tank of the world. And this is also a great honor for all of us uh, that Justice Breyer gave his name to this lecture series. And I must say that over the last 12 months, the Dutch were even more interested in the United States than usual. 
First, the presidential campaign was the main focus, and now everybody is watching your new president closely. And yes, also in the Netherlands, there is a lot of talk about the US Supreme Court and the Trias Politica in your constitution. And we admire your system with all its checks and balances. The judicial branch is the backbone of our democratic societies. And thank you, Justice Breyer, for your commitment to our lecture series. We are very grateful for that. And thank you, Brookings, for your great hospitality. Today at this uh, fourth annual, sorry, <coughs> today at this fourth annual Justice Stephen Breyer lecture, hosted by the Foreign Policy Programme at Brookings, we will focus on the intersection of techno technological innovations and international law. Well, The Hague is at the crossroads of international law and warfare, including cyber threats. As you all know, The Hague is the legal capital of the world with all its courts and tribunals. In The Hague, the world tries to prevent war with courts like the International Court of Justice in the Peace Palace, the only main organ of the United Nations based outside of New York. And if sadly enough war breaks out, if conflicts erupt and escalate, with all the violations of human rights that comes with it, we now have tools to prosecute violators. The Global Tribunal, the International Criminal Court, to punish the war criminals has its seat in The Hague. And The Hague is also rapidly evolving into a security hub. In The Hague, we have the largest security cluster in Europe, the so-called The Hague Security Delta. More than 200 companies, knowledge institutes and NGOs are working together to create a better and safer world a wonderful example of public-private partnership. Several other security hubs in the world are now studying this attractive public-private model. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in extraordinary times. Terrorism is on the rise in the physical world and in the cyber world. Of course, these two are nowadays intertwined. The Hague Security Delta already has a wealth of knowledge in the field of cybersecurity. And of course, we also need international regulations and laws in the digital world. The digital world offers us an overload of data. The smart use of these data, for instance, the so-called big data for humanity, can be used to avert conflicts and to ease humanitarian and natural disasters. But how do we protect digi digital privacy, privacy in a world without borders? And I'm very much interested in what our keynote speaker, John Carlin, will tell us. Under his leadership, the National Security Division launched a nationwide outreach effort across industries to raise awareness of national security, cyber and espionage threats against American companies. In a transnational cyber world, there definitely is an international responsibility concerning cybersecurity matters. I'm also looking forward to an interesting panel discussion moderated by Jeroen van der Hoven from the Technical Delft Top University. I want to mention one other person who is with us today, Dan Chaffet. A French lawyer born in Denmark and based in Paris. Dan, where are you? Okay. I'm here there. Raise your hand, please. Yeah. Dan is specialized in IT laws, data privacy, and human rights on the internet, and is an individual specialist for UNESCO on internet law. In 2014, he founded the Association for Accountability and Internet De Democracy. And the main objective of which is to introduce a general principle of accountability on the internet in order to secure the protection of human integrity. Confusion over boundaries between good and bad uses on the World Wide Web is growing. The necessary standards and protocols for applying technology to facilitate effective accountability are lacking. 
and during the work lunch after this event, Dan will tell us a little bit more about his ideas concerning the setup of an international uh, the setup of a, the seat of an international internet ombudsman uh, in The Hague. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all an inspiring session here at Brookings. Thank you very much, and I'm very honored to invite John Carlin to give his keynote speech. Good morning. I uh, am so pleased and honored to uh, receive the invitation to give the keynote at this address. Uh, I was a little surprised uh, because I'm not an expert on international law. And then I looked at the humble words of Justice Breyer when he delivered the lecture bearing his own name on international law the first time, which he began by saying he is neither an expert on international law or the law of other nations. And if Justice Breyer does not believe he qualifies, I assuredly do not. So for those of you expecting a discourse on the abstract nuances of Bavarian law, you will not get it uh, today. Turn your webcast off. What I, uh, what I did do was, as you've heard from background, confront a new type of threat in my job overseeing the National Security Division. The National Security Division at the Department of Justice was the first new litigating division in about 50 years. And it reflected a transformation in the Justice Department in our approach to threats that was driven by our nation's response to the devastating attacks of September 11th. And the idea was simple, that prior to September 11th, we had failed to adequately share information across the law enforcement and intelligence divide. And that failure to adequately share information, be driven by what that intelligence showed the threat to be, had led to the unnecessary death of thousands of people. And it was a mistake that couldn't be repeated again. At the National Security Division, that meant, in addition to certain legal changes that allowed the sharing of that information, culturally there was a change. And that the lawyers who prosecute cases through our criminal justice system would sit side by side with the lawyers who worked with the intelligence community to gain information about what the threats were. And that success would no longer be measured by the successful prosecution of a terrorist after the fact, when families are grieving and have lost loved ones. That may be important to hold people accountable, but that's not success. Success would be working through your legal framework, using all of the available legal tools to figure out how to prevent that attack from occurring in the first place so that no one was harmed. When you think about what the threat looked like then, and we became very effective at applying this approach, it really had to do with the movement of people and things. So old Al-Qaeda, in their strategic approach, relied on a model that involved getting people into a difficult to reach area in Afghanistan and Pakistan, training them, uh, infusing them with uh, further ideological fervor, and then deploying them back to commit complex terrorist attacks. And strategically, Al-Qaeda believed that success required them to do an attack of equal or greater scale than the attack of September 11th. That was complex, and it required taking these people, moving them overseas, training them, redeploying them, multiple people, getting things or objects into their hands so they could do attacks of devastating consequences. And when you think about what Al-Qaeda did in the attack of September 11th, like many of the issues we're going to talk about today, they took advantage of a change in technology that's caused so much good, airplanes, that have uh, allowed people to connect throughout the world. And they took that technological innovation and turned it into a literal weapon of mass destruction to kill. As we became better at that approach of working side by side across our legal departments and agencies and across countries to make it difficult for Al Qaeda to do what it wanted to do, the threat changed. The new iteration of the threat, the growth of the Islamic State of the Levant, who was particularly good at taking advantage of this uh, change, took advantage of a change in technology that we're all familiar with, which was the revolution in the way that we're digitally communicating, the boom in social media. And what they did, just like Al Qaeda had done with aviation, is they took something that uh, has many, many positive and beneficial uses and learned how to weaponize it. And there what they did was they took the low barrier to create very sophisticated propaganda and 
But when I say sophisticated, we, uh, we ran a program in Department of Justice consistent with the all tools approach, approach, different than anything I'd ever done there in my years before, where we met, um, he as the lead uh, national security lawyer and then the head of our National Counterterrorism Center. And we met with folks from Silicon Valley, uh, with Hollywood uh, directors, with advertisers, and we just said, this is the new threat. Look at what they're producing on social media as they try to turn human beings into weapons, as essentially they're trying to crowdsource terrorism. And what we showed them was these are thousands of micro-targeted messages being sent out at the same quality as commercial advertising and targeting specific demographics, and they're sent out day in, day out. And it's having a real impact. It's changed just as we, our terrorism cases had been going down. They started to spike again. And what we saw was different. In the United States, at least, there was no, uh, thankfully, whole community that felt geographically isolated that they could target. What we saw instead was a growth of terrorism cases across all 50 states. So the FBI director said there are investigations open in all 50 states. And during my last two years in the division, you saw an explosion in the number of criminal prosecutions that we were bringing. We brought more cases than we'd ever brought before. And what did the cases look like? They weren't in any one particular region. Uh, we brought cases in over 30 different states and counting. What they did have in common is the age of the defendant. In over half of the cases, the defendants were 25 or younger. And most troubling, in one third, approximately, one third of the cases, the defendants were 21 or younger. In an international terrorism cases, that's simply never been the face of the threat that we've seen before. And it's directly linked, I think, to the other phenomenon, which was that in almost every single one of those cases, social media was involved. And what it was is it's showing the success of this uh, crowdsourcing of terrorism where a terrorist group located overseas outside of our laws is deliberately targeting young and troubled people to try to convince them to kill where they live. At first, their message was, come join us as a foreign terrorist fighter. And as the world, through uh, the United Nations and an unprecedented resolution, unanimously said, we're going to work together to prevent foreign terrorists from coming from our countries into that region to do what they do. And what the Islamic State Levant does, make no mistake about it, is they murder Muslims and non-Muslims alike with impunity. They use rape as a political tool and a recruitment tool. This is a face of evil in every country, no matter what our other differences, came together in the United Nations resolution several uh, years ago to commit to combat that plague. However, as we got better at preventing the movement of people into that region, they switched their strategy and said, kill where you live. And they used social media to do it, and that's when we start seeing the spike. Message after message every day, it has a very small success rate. And when I convened that group and was hearing from advertisers, what we did essentially is describe the threat um, consistent with their all tools approach and say, hey, the government's not in the best position to stop this message from reaching these people and working. What can you do about it? And it was interesting to hear them analyze it. They're the ones who told me how sophisticated the advertising was. They looked at details like how the Islamic State and the Levant put their brand. Um, so I have a little ISIL brand on each one of these micro-targeted demogra uh, demographic ads. And when I say slickly produced uh, ads that look commercial quality, what I'm talking about, and this is a literal ad, it's not the devastating images of someone being slowly beheaded alive or burned alive, although they put that out. That's for people to scare people who are their enemies and for those who've already joined the group. When they're recruiting, they do something else, very similar to what I used to see when I was prosecuting sexual offense cases, which is they groom. So it doesn't start with that type of violent image. Instead, it starts with images of a handsome young terrorist uh, overseas in the Levant handing out cotton candy to children. And that is what the picture of life is going to be like in the Levant. And these advertising experts were saying they did it in soft lens uh, to make it look even uh, more bucolic. And then uh, uh, that was the US ad. When I went over to Europe and was talking to an audience there, and this goes to the micro-targeting, they had a very similar ad, also done in soft lens, also done with the brand. But there, the terrorist was handing out, uh, instead of cotton candy, Nutella. Uh, because that's what, uh, that, that was the popular treat of choice for kids. It shows who they're targeting, how sophisticated it is, and it couldn't happen but for our change in digital technology. That's why a terrorist 
overseas, located in ungoverned space, is able to reach in and cause a threat in the basements uh, where children are playing online inside the United States, in Europe, and in other parts uh, around, around the world. That's what the threat looks like when it comes to terrorism. Let me, uh, let me expand that out a little bit to a different type of terrorist case that's linked to this new approach of crowdsourcing terrorism. So imagine you're at a private company uh, inside the uh, United States, in Europe, elsewhere, uh, uh, throughout the world. And your information technology professional, your IT folks inside the company, the ones who are in charge of making sure your system is safe, say, hey, boss, I know we're in this mainstream uh, retail company. We got a trusted brand. Someone intruded inside our system, and they don't look like they're the world's most sophisticated hacker. They weren't very good. And what they stole was a relatively small amount of personally identifiable information, names, addresses, way smaller than what we normally see. But don't worry, we got it. The vast majority of companies around the world handle that on their own. They don't report it at that point, nor does it even a high-risk event that gets uh, reported up to their own executive management. So let's say a couple of weeks later, the same guy comes knocking back on the door and says, boss, we just received through Gmail, let's say, uh, a, an email that says, give me 500 bucks through Bitcoin or I'm going to embarrass the company by releasing the fact that we were able to get into your system. This also happens every day across the world and the vast majority of companies don't report. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as ransomware. And there are different ways that can occur, but it's the same idea of extorting uh, money for fear of cyber threat. And most companies either decide on their own not to pay, because they don't think there's that really uh, great a risk that somebody's bluffing, or they make the payments. As far as ransomware where goes, 500 bucks, payment through Bitcoin, unsophisticated hack, this is about as low end a ransomware threat as you're gonna see. And most companies wouldn't report it. In this case, and those are real facts, in this case, the company did work with government and with law enforcement, and lucky they did, because it wasn't what it looked like. It was a low-level uh, criminal trying to get 500 bucks, but it was also an extremist from Kosovo who had moved from Kosovo to Malaysia, his name was Farizi, from Malaysia had hacked into this US-based multinational trusted retail brand company and stolen these names and addresses. And then through Twitter, had become friends with someone who was one of the more notorious cyber terrorists in the world at the time, a British citizen named Junaid Hussein, who had moved from London to Raqqa, Syria, where he was located at the heart of the Islamic State of the Levant. He never met Farizi in the real world. But through uh, Twitter and other means, they communicated. He radicalizes Farizi, and Farizi provides those stolen names and addresses to Junaid Hussein in Raqqa, Syria. And what does he do with that information? He does what uh, the Islamic State Levant had been doing, which is tries to weaponize it to crowdsource terrorism and culls through the list of stolen names and addresses for those who look like their government employees, because it's a .mil or a .gov, whether it's a state employee or a federal. He then culls that into a kill list using Twitter pushes that kill list back to the United States and calls on the adherents of the Islamic State of the Levant to kill these people by name, by address, using the stolen information that was entrusted with a retail company. Real case. Because we were able to work together, we were able to take effective action. But what did it require? It required the United States working cooperatively with Malaysia to execute a criminal arrest warrant and Farizi was arrested by the Malaysians, brought to the United States, faced, uh, signed a lawyer, faced trial, pled guilty, and was sentenced to 20 years this past July. Junaid Hussein was in ungoverned space in Raqqa, Syria, at the heart of the Islamic State of the Levant. He was killed in a publicly acknowledged military strike by Central Command. Think about what that threat is and the speed at which it's moving. It requires us to do something we haven't done before. If you think of all the billions of dollars and energy that went into transforming how we approach cross-border terrorism threats after September 11th, almost all of that framework time and energy went into sharing within government and across governments. This threat requires something we simply haven't done before and is an order of magnitude harder. 
which is how do you figure out, how do you share that information with the private sector where most of this information and uh, infrastructure resides? How do you share what you're seeing on threats effectively so they can defend themselves and take necessary actions? And how do you incentivize and properly encourage information sharing back so that you can combat the threat? And how do you do that in a, with a speed of threat that moves so fast at the speed of digital? I mean, think about this case alone. It's five different countries that you have to work across. And the citizens involved are of five or six different nationalities. That is going to be, is, and will continue to be the new face of, the, uh, of national security threats. Let me switch from there then to cyber uh, properly. When it came to cyber-related threats, I used to prosecute uh, these cases. And when I did, I worked only on the criminal side of the house. And when I was prosecuting these cases, I worked with an FBI squad. There was another squad that did the intelligence. They were behind a literal lock, secure door. And I never knew what the heck they were doing back there, and I never went on the other side of the door. And as those of you know who lo are looking at the criminal threats, there was plenty to do even 10, 15 years ago on the criminal side of the house, so I wasn't banging on that door looking for more work. Occasionally an agent would switch squads, and they just disappeared, never to be seen again, doing whatever they did on the intelligence side. When I went over to the FBI to be chief of staff to then Director Mueller, the door opened. And one thing we were working on was, how can we at the FBI share information across the different government agencies to get a better picture of the threat? And we did a pretty good job at the time. And in fact, we had a giant jumbotron screen, much larger than the one behind me. And on that jumbotron screen, we could watch in real time as nation state adversaries hacked day in, day out into the United States all across, and they'd hack something like a Brookings or a university, sometimes to steal information there, but sometimes just to hop from that university into a corporation, then we would literally watch, because they had a visual graphic, we would watch the data exfiltrate out of the United States. So incredible intelligence feat. Not a win, uh, though. It didn't feel good watching it, because it became clear what we're seeing isn't traditional espionage. It isn't the collection of intelligence for national security defense uh, that's been legal under uh, and recognized under international law for hundreds of years. Instead, it's causing real damage to real victims now, billions of dollars worth of loss of intellectual property and trade secrets. And so we had to change our approach. When I went back to the Justice Department to head the National Security Division, it became clear that, number one, we, were, we hadn't made the changes in this arena that we had made when it came to combating terrorism. So we weren't opening that door and sharing information. We changed that and created new national security cyber uh, specialists in every U.S. attorney's office. The FBI issued an edict then that said, thou shalt share this information with this new specially trained cadre who know both the bits and the bytes and Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and Electronic Communication Privacy Act, but also are trained to handle sensitive sources and methods and now are read in on what the actual threat looks like when it comes to national security actors. And then we made a determination we were going to change approach take what had only been in the shadows of the intelligence world, just like Cold War espionage, and try to bring it out. Because if our challenge includes getting the private sector on board, we have to figure out ways to talk publicly about what the threats are so they can protect themselves and so that there's a will to take action. That change of appro in approach led to the first case of its kind, the indictment of five members of the People's Liberation Army, Unit 61398. This unit of the second largest military of the world in China was targeting private companies for the benefit of their economic competitors. And when we charged this case, it caused a fair amount of controversy at the time. Why are you bringing criminal charges against state actors? So let me talk a little bit about why. Number one, you got to look at the act, what was actually happening. So if you read the, uh, the facts that are put forth in that charging document, we go into detail about what this crime looked like. And what it looks like is theft. So you'd see, even though they were literally wearing the uniform of another army, they were going in and stealing things like right before a company here was, a uh, multinational company here was doing a joint venture with a Chinese company where they were going to lease a lead pipe. You watch these members of the military go in literally the night before, and steal the technical design specifications for the pipe so they wouldn't have to pay for it. Or to use another example, this was a US subsidiary of a German multinational solar company. 
They went in, and there what they stole was the pricing information. So it's not always the intellectual property. They stole the pricing information. They used that stolen information to price dump and force that company into bankruptcy by price dumping. Then, to add insult to, to injury, when that company sued for an unfair trade practice, they stole all the litigation uh, strategy. A true insult to lawyers. But the, so what we were seeing is essentially anything that wasn't locked down, they, they were stealing. So that, that is partly why we brought This wasn't traditional uh, intelligence collection. This was theft. Secondly, and importantly, I think for today's uh, discussion, we never really made a choice that said it was OK to steal information. We just hadn't come up with an effective way to deter it. But the fact is, if we were allowing this to noisily occur, Day in and day out, I think the director of uh, Comey compared it to the actions of a drunken burglar in terms of how much damage they're causing in systems. If we allow them to noisily do it, it's like uh, in, US, in US law, we have a common uh, example from our common law, which is if you let someone walk across your lawn long enough without telling them to stop, they have what's called an easement. They gain the right to walk across your lawn. International law, uh, a large portion of it is international customary law. It's the same concept. And so if you think about it uh, with that analogy, this case was like a giant no trespass sign, get off our lawn. But it was vitally important to do this, to take actual action so that we don't set the customary law bar as saying this type of activity is OK, but instead encourage other nations to, uh, to be disciplined and stick to this norm that says this is not OK. This is not the way we want to live. You should be, instead of investing all of that money into stealing this information, incentivized to invest this money into research and development. That case was more successful. I think, than we thought it would be. I thought it was the beginning of a uh, new approach. But it turned out to be, I think, quite impactful on changing, changing Chinese behavior. Let me fast forward a little bit to the next major cyber intrusion. So we had war gamed out for years what it would look like if a rogue nuclear armed nation state decided to attack the United States through cyber enabled means. And we all got it wrong, because we never pictured that their first big attack was going to be over a movie about a bunch of pot smokers. That is what happened with the Sony uh, North Korean in, uh, intrusion. It's the only time in my career that I've gone to the Situation Room and had to brief the President uh, National Security Council on a serious national security threat and start the briefing by trying to describe the plot of that, uh, that movie, which if you've seen it, is not easy to do. But the reason why we treated it like a national, not an act of war, but like a national, serious national security threat is what else was it? It was an, it was an attack on a fundamental right of free expression. And it was also uh, an attack inside the boundaries of another nation uh, state. And so we wanted to send a message back, not just to North Korea, but to all of the other countries and even non-state actors who are figuring out, what can we do in cyber uh, space? Is it different? Is it, as many have described, and it currently looks like in some respects, the Wild West? Or is it going to be something governed by the rule of law? In order to take that response, though, we couldn't have done it without Sony's cooperation. Right away, they did the right thing. And within hours, we're cooperating. That is the only reason why we were able to do what's vital in these types of cases, which is the investigation and attribution to figure out who did it. That's why we could, in less than 28 days, have the confidence that it was North Korea of such a high degree that the Bureau, in an unprecedented uh, move, put it out in a public statement, and the president echoed it from the podium in the White House. The other thing we realized going around that situ situation room table, though, is that we were lucky in some respects that it was uh, North Korea. Because unlike the well-honed system we had when it came to putting in sanctions about the movement of people and things. So we had an effective regime for terrorists uh, that we've used to great effect to deny funding and other means. And we had a sanctions regime set up for those who would proliferate weapons of mass destruction. But we did not have an executive order that allowed sanctioning for cyber-enabled activity, even if it was activity that harmed the fundamental national security or economic interests of the United States. Luckily, in that case, North Korea had done so many other things we had an available tool because it was North Korea. And if it had been somebody else, we wouldn't. That's what led to, in April of that year, a new executive order that allows for the sanctioning, not just of those who steal information, but significantly, or cause destruction, but significantly those who benefit 
including companies or individuals, from stolen inter information. So even if the People's Liberation Army stole it, if the company that was the beneficiary, the rival company in China, was uh, benefited from it, they could be sanctioned. I think it was the combination of the criminal case, that new executive order, and a belief that we were going to continue to raise the costs uh, because this was not an acceptable way, this uh, rampant theft of information, that caused the highest levels of Chinese le leadership to take a look at uh, what they were doing and led to a breakthrough, a diplomatic breakthrough. President Xi sent a delegation. We negotiated with them on a so-called four points uh, agreement. And President Xi, along with President Obama, announced together as one of those four points that it is wrong to use one's military or uh, intelligence services to target a private company for the competitive be uh, benefit of its rival. Essentially, that was the norm. That break breakthrough led to the G20 adopting those same four points. I think that's the beginning in this Wild West of coming up with laws that we can all uh, agree on. Now, I, I wouldn't have had much of a career as a prosecutor and in law enforcement if agreeing on laws meant that everybody followed them. So the next step then is ensuring that we enforce those laws that we agree on. And you've seen us um, attempt to apply this new approach not just with North Korea or China, we had named four major actors that caused uh, problems in this space. Iran, North Korea, China, and Russia. So that we've talked about North Korea and China. You also announced charges against Iranian-affiliated actors for their denial of service attacks that hit 47, uh, 46 different financial institutions affecting hundreds of thousands of customers and costing tens of millions of dollars. That same group did what would violate another one of these four-point norms, which is, they went in and accessed the sluice control systems of a dam in Rye, New York, the Bowman Dam. If that dam had been working properly, they would have been able to remotely open the dam and flood uh, the area uh, that was down beneath the dam. Now, as it so happens, that dam wasn't working. It was down for maintenance. But we decided that our crumbling infrastructure should not be our first deterrence against uh, cyber threats. <laughs> so we continued, uh, so we did bring, bring charges. The last, and the one that's gotten a little bit of attention uh, since then, is the Russian uh, interference with U.S. elections, with the intent to undermine confidence. And make no mistake, this wasn't just uh, an attack on the United States. This is part of a concerted effort against democracy and the principle that people should be able to freely elect their government. That is why, and they view it as a success. So in that instance, I think we were not fast enough when you look back at taking this new approach of figuring out who did it, it was made public on October 7th before the election as to who did it. That was not adequate deterrence. After the election on December, uh, I believe, 29th or around there, you saw deterrent action taken. If that had been taken pre-election, uh, I think it would have had a far greater impact because it was actually one of the most uh, severe series of actions that have been taken to deter. It combined sanctions against 11 uh, different individuals or entities, throwing out, PNGing a variety of intelligence operatives inside the United States, closing two facilities, and releasing malware uh, that Russians were using to compromise systems across the world. But timing matters. And this is important, I think, to examine, try to learn whatever lessons we can with a clear-eyed examination, because they're targeting European elections now, and we just heard the director of the FBI, the head of our national security agency, say to Congress several weeks ago in testimony that did not get enough uh, attention. From, uh, there was uh, attention paid to all sorts of other parts of the testimony, but not to the most chilling statement in it, which is they said, Russia's going to do it again in 2020. That was their assessment. They may do it as early as 2018, and it looks like they're going to do it in Europe as well. This, I think, requires collective action around the world, and part of that model needs to be a concerted uh, approach that says we can and will figure out who did it, that two, we're not afraid to make it public, as we've seen in other instances now, whether it's China or North Korea, and third, that there will be severe consequences and that we will continue to up the level of the consequences until the behavior stops, because it's not acceptable to use uh, concerted campaigns to try to undermine confidence in democratic elections throughout the world. That, uh, that challenge awaits. Let me end uh, with one or two other thoughts. 
One, as we are trying to figure out how to combat these threats that are data-driven, be it uh, Islamic State exploitation of terrorism or cyber-enabled attacks, including blended threats that combine criminal activity and nation-state activity, we have to do and figure out a better way to uh, combat conflicts of laws that make it incredibly difficult to issue lawful process in order to be able to take effective action. And this cuts across a couple different ways. One is figuring out how to incentivize, and this is one of the four points, uh, countries to, if some criminal activity is coming from within their borders, to cooperate, to take effective action to prevent another uh, state citizens from being uh, attacked criminally or through nation state means. A good example of how not to do this would be what was just re uh, revealed in the Justice Department indictment of Russian actors uh, linked to the Yahoo case, where in that case, the FBI had sought to cooperate with its Russian counterparts, shared information about who the crook was who was committing criminal activity, and then they recruited that individual and started using him as an intelligence asset to use the stolen information from companies. So that, that would be an example of how not to, do, uh, not to do that norm. So that's one. Secondly, when it comes to the movement of data across borders, it is in the interests of human rights, uh, in the protection of civil liberties, it's in the interest of national security, criminal justice, and economic growth, I think, to encourage a regime where data can move freely. But in order to do that, we also need a regime where individual sovereign states feel that they have the necessary legal tools to protect their citizens. That is a hard problem to solve. The failure uh, right now of solving it effectively is driving towards data localization, which I don't think anyone, regardless of your perspective, thinks is a good result, whether it's for human rights, law enforcement, or economic uh, reasons. The frustration that I've uh, heard all the time, and the U.S. is often the recipient of it, because right now the, the uh, largest companies are located within the U.S., is let's say I was meeting with a colleague in Europe or United Kingdom, and they said, well, look, when I'm investigating a murder inside my own state's boundary of one U.K. citizen on another, I need to serve process, and often the email, other data is, is essential to bring in the case. When I go to serve it on your company, the U.S.-based internet service provider, they say it's forbidden under U.S. law for me to provide you that information. Instead, you need to use what's called a multilateral assistance treaty, or MLAT. I'm only exaggerating slightly, but MLATs are essentially older than the dawn of time and require you to do something in quill, in quintuplicate, and with a thousand pages on yellowed pamphlet. And so they are not efficient. They take at least 10 months. So to tell a local police officer your investigation's on hold while you make this international legal request of another country has not been a satisfactory answer. Because of that, um, there's increasing pressure then they're taking action anyway, and the pressure now in a lot of cases is forcing either, um, in some cases, arresting company officials for failure to uh, comply with process, or in other cases, demanding that data on uh, citizens be held within the country's uh, boundaries, which maximizes the ability to access it for other reasons as well. So one approach, I, I don't have that confidence now, that much confidence now that we're going to be able to solve this problem for the whole world at once with some massive treaty. So instead, one approach that we were trying with, with the United Kingdom was, if it's a country that fundamentally shares our uh, values um, and we provide equivalent, not necessarily the same, but equivalent legal protections, a judicial-based uh, process, a uh, certain uh, uh, standard of proof that you have to hit under the law, that if it's an uh, investigation that involves your own citizens, essentially takes place on your territory, that instead of using the MLAT, you can serve the, the same type of process you would serve inside your country. That uh, model, and you know, there are complexities in the details, but a, a version of that got introduced by uh, the Justice Department and the Obama administration in July of last year. And one reason I'm uh, curious to hear people's thoughts, but I think that's a good potential model would be if you can one by one get countries uh, to join on, show that it works, that it's respectful both of privacy and civil liberties and allows law enforcement to do their job, 
then I think it creates a, uh, a bar that other countries will be encouraged to increase their legal protections, civil liberties protections and others, because they want to take advantage of this type of treaty arrangement. And it will reduce the pressure for, for law enforcement or national security means for people to come up with their own solutions and place companies in the unenviable situation of being right at the center of a conflict of laws. So I will uh, close there and just say, as we approach these, I'm so glad we're holding this topic today, but it's never been more urgent uh, in terms of what the threats are that we're facing and that the, uh, our respective national security communities are facing. And we're right at the cusp of another technological transformation. So as much damage as can be done by the free movement of data um, that comes from exploiting a move where we took everything that we value that was in analog, papers, books, moved it into digital space, then connected it through a protocol to the internet that was never designed with security in mind. We did so at an incredibly rapid pace without accounting properly for risk, and we're playing catch up. That's where we are. We're on the cusp of another change, though, and this is the so-called internet of things. This is billions and billions of new devices that are already starting to be rolled out that connect everything um, from pacemakers in our hearts, the first versions that were rolled out didn't have encryption and were uh, hackable, to drones in the skies, same thing happened there, to cars on the road by 2020, even if they're not self-driving, essentially, according to most studies, about 70% of cars on the road are essentially going to be computers on wheels. And as was shown by a proof of concept hack where someone came in through an entertainment system, took over the steering and braking system that led to the recall of 1.4 million uh, vehicles inside the United States, those two were rolled out without taking uh, security into account in the design process. And it's not through bad intent. It's that the incentives were, does the product work as designed? And the answer for the pacemaker, for the drone, for the cars was yes. What they weren't adequately taking into account was, what would happen if a bad guy, a crook, a terrorist, a rogue nation state chose to take advantage of vulnerabilities? Have we built in security by design? As we're on the cusp of this transformation, that might be as, you know, in just in one area alone, might be as significant as when you move from a horse and buggy to a car with a driver is going to be the move and the impacts on society from a car with a driver to a driverless car. We have to get that right on the front end, and the time for that is now. Thank you.